Welcome back to the Black Media Man Cave, where I do commentary and review of movies with an all-black cast or at least a black lead. Today's movie is a personal favorite of mine. I'm not even going to try to sound unbiased. It's School Days, a 1988 film written and directed by Spike Lee and his second movie after She's Gotta Have It. School Days is a movie about the black college experience told from several viewpoints during the homecoming weekend of a fictional school called Mission College. The movie has everything you need to round out that HBCU experience. It's got fraternities, it's got activism, it's even got uh, musical numbers. It's got everything but actual classes. Spock Lee said that he intended the movie to be a microcosm of black society all crammed into one campus and it deals with a lot of issues that sadly are still relevant today. Issues like colorism, hair discrimination, hazing, and elitism. It boasts an amazing cast of people that mostly went on to have amazing careers and it's way too many to name, but the main cast consists of Spike Lee himself, Lawrence Fishburne, Giancarlo Esposito, Tisha Campbell, Bill Nunn, Kadeem Hardison, Samuel L. Jackson, Ossie Davis, and many, many more. I know I said Dead Presidents had possibly the best assortment of black talent on screen, but I think this movie actually beats it. For a lot of the cast, this was either their first or one of their first movies but you can hardly tell by watching them. But is this great class of characters enough to give this movie a passing grade? Let's black track and find out. The movie starts with this brother named Dap, who's played by Lawrence Fishburne, giving a speech on the steps of the main administration building. He's pissed off and fired up about the school's reluctance to divest money to South Africa when a lot of other schools, including white schools, are already doing it. It's getting received pretty well, even if these rusty old timers in the window don't too much care for what he has to say. That is, until the speech is interrupted by an impromptu step show put on by what seems to be this school's most active fraternity. Gamma Phi Gamma. It's not only homecoming week, but it's also pledge week, or hell week as it was called when I was in school. That's when the new pledges go through their final trials before they cross over. They get marched out like a couple of pound puppies by the leader of these Gamma Dogs. This flat talk from Dick Tracy looking motherfucker named Big Brother Almighty. You see, Big Brother Almighty here doesn't too much care for all this back to Africa talk, because where else but America is he gonna find a light skinned, silky haired queen like old Jane Toussaint here, played by Tisha Campbell in only her second movie role. As expected, Dap is appalled at the disrespect, but before he can get a leash and walk the dog on these gammas, the student body president steps in to neuter the situation. I abhor and will not tolerate violence or the threat of violence on this sacred campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fuck you, scrotum face. Damn, this dude is getting no respect. Why the Dean seen him out there to the wolves like that? Dap has a queen of his own, more of the natural variety. She's really rocking that Grace Jones if you ask me. No sicky weed for her. We get a roll call of all the Gamma Phi Gamma leaders, and I've always been impressed by their super clever names. I wonder how long it took for them to come up with all these little dance moves to go with this. The Gamma Brothers don't really approve of their performance and they definitely don't approve of the rumor that one of them is a virgin. Big Brother Almighty goes down the line and they each get called out by their less catchy by comparison but still hilarious nicknames. Look at all those faces, they're terrified. Big Brother Almighty stops at a pledge named Half Pint played by Spike Lee himself and accuses him of being the virgin. He tells him that he has by the night to find a freak or he's out of there. You would think that wouldn't be difficult on a college campus, but under this kind of pressure, I don't know. Spike Lee said he wanted the gammas to represent the worst aspects of fraternity culture, and honestly, the portrayal doesn't seem that far off from what I've heard over the years. Hey, I didn't pledge, and from what I heard, many fraternities were none too happy about how Spike presented them in this movie. Hey, all I'm gonna say is, this movie is the only reason that I ever even thought about pledging. Turns out Half Pint is Dap's cousin, and he lets him know that he's in deep if he doesn't come back with a woman tonight. Turns out he actually is a virgin, and he needs his cousin's advice on what to do. Dap tells him to just go out to a female dorm, introduce himself to some ladies, and just be himself. That is some terrible advice. Gee, cuz, if it was that easy, I wouldn't have to pledge, cuz that's literally the only reason that dudes pledge. I guess since we have Gamma Phi Gammas, their mortal enemies needed a name too, so that's why Dap's crew is named the Fellas. One of the Fellas is played by Kadeem Hardison, and if you feel like you're seeing a lot of the cast from a different world TV show in this movie, since we just saw Jasmine Guy and Daryl Bell earlier, that's because both this movie and A Different World was casted by the same person, who's Robbie Reed. Hey, don't act like most people don't get jobs based off recommendations. Half Pint is still on a mission at Mission to do a little penile intro mission with female's permission and he ends up at the female dorm. 
Or is it a brothel? Since apparently you could just call girls down to the lobby and proposition them until you find your favorite. I like how carefree this is. It sure wasn't this easy when I was in school. All the girls just willingly come downstairs and get sampled like it's a cold stone creamery. Only half pint is moving way too fast and the ladies aren't ready to give up the flavor that easily. You know what's funny about this whole situation? Two out of the four girls actually like him. So it's not like half pint can't get a girl if he wanted to. He just can't get it for tonight. Dude in the background looking like I wouldn't let that happen to me. Half Pint has to deliver the bad news to the rest of the Gamites that there will be no bone burying tonight. The rest of the pledges feel like he's holding them back from the many blessings of Big Brother Almighty. But one of them has a pretty clever idea if you ask me. I want you to take that $5 US currency and go to the pet shop. Get yourself a kitten, put it in a cage, and mark it pussy. Give it to Dean Big Brother Almighty and say, Pass the pussy. Pass the pussy. <laughs> you know what? Bit Brother Almighty wouldn't have a choice but to give him points for comedy. The Gamma Rays are having a meeting about absolutely nothing, to be honest. You know, all these years I thought they were a sorority, but turns out they're just some organization that every fraternity has, according to Spike. They get more shine than any other sorority in this movie, though, since there are no other sororities in this movie. Must be wasn't in the budget. Wow, catfight. The Gamma Rays just happen to run into every dark-skinned woman on campus after their meeting ends, and it turns into an argument about whose hair looks better. Dap's girlfriend is the leader of the darker women, I guess, and the Gamma Rays call them the Jigaboos. I really wish Spike came up with a better name for them because it just sounds so much more offensive than calling the Gamma Rays the wannabes. Spike Lee's real-life sister is there in the front on the Jigaboo side, but I think that's just really Spike in the wig. Damn, Spike, if you wanted another role in the movie, you should have just said so. It's your movie. Instead of a fight, this little war of words leads to a dance-off and a musical number that was composed by Spike Lee's father. The song is great and it's my favorite song in the entire movie. Supposedly, the choreography took over two weeks to get right and film and I could believe it. Especially with some of these long takes where you just know they had to get it right in one take and do it all over again. The whole premise of this over-the-top dance scene is to show how silly it is for black women to be arguing over whose hair is better than the others and who's embracing their blackness versus who's trying to be white. These kind of arguments still go on today and in the end, they are still all beautiful black women, no matter what their hair looks like. The whole thing is made even more silly by the fact that it seems to have simultaneously taken place in all their heads. The Gamites couldn't get a freak and therefore must be punished and it's no secret what a fraternity punishment looks like. Hope y'all dudes wore several pairs of underwear. Every time they get hit, each one has a catchphrase. Oh, ow! I'm cooking the cocoa puffs. Oh, I'm I wants to get fucked up. Yo, is that supposed to be spontaneous or did the gammas make them rehearse this? Yo, man, you're getting a little too frisky there, ain't you? It's coronation night for Miss Mission, and the gamma rays are so excited they hitting that rock steady. At least that's what the dance was called when I was growing up. This coronation feels more like a talent show since Jane and her backup singers put on another musical number. No scratch that, this is beyond a talent show. This is an entire Beyonce level concert. Why is she in college if she got a whole musical career going? It makes sense when you realize this was basically filmed for the promotional music video for the movie. Spike Lee said he really only wanted three women for this performance but added the fourth girl on the left for some unspecified reason. If that's why she's so far off to the left, it's like she had to learn the routine on the fly at the last minute. Dap couldn't make it to the Miss Mission coronation, unfortunately, because I know he was dying to be there. That's okay, though, because his girlfriend comes over for a mission of greater importance. A little sweaty in-outs, if you will. Like, real sweaty. Damn, open the window or turn on a box fan or something. Of course, Dap is too militant for his own good and ruins the moment by getting mad at Rachel for wanting to join a sorority. I'm kind of with him on that one. She has like 14 homegirls. Why not just start your own sorority? Yeah, that little love scene was nice and all, but let Big Brother Almighty show you how the gammas do it. Somehow, this sex scene is nastier than Depp's, despite them not really doing anything. The story goes that Tisha Campbell's mom was on set, and since Tisha was only 18 at the time of filming, she refused to allow her to do anything that resembled actual sex, nude or otherwise. So instead, they came up with a clever way to film this scene and included a bunch of weird camera angles and Tisha licking various parts of Big Brother Almighty. Yeah, that's right, girl. Lick that part. I know you taste them juices and berries. They look wild at the end like they actually did something. You know what's a staple of most HBCUs for some reason? Terrible football teams, especially during homecoming. Mission College is no different, and that's despite Coach Ossie Davis giving a nearly four-minute speech that's essentially a sermon. God told and explained to Jonah that the essence of love is to labor for something. Go out there and kick somebody. This is so hilarious to me because I can see this happening in every HBCU locker room right before the team goes out to get beat by like 50. 
It's a good thing nobody at black schools even pays attention to what's happening on the field anyway. I don't even think there's an actual game going on in this film because it only shows the crowd. That drum major is getting it. This dude should have had more scenes. There's that rock steady again. That dance must have just got popular the year this movie came out. Of course the team loses by 40 and in typical fashion, what goes on in the stands is better than what happens on the field. The fellas are starting to lose faith in the South Africa movement once the dean threatens to put them out of school if they continue. Dap is disappointed that they are so easily scared away from their position, but they feel like they can't risk not graduating even if it is for a worthy cause. This scene is deeper than it appears and I'm sure a lot of black students go through a lot of inner struggles about going to school to get a job in a corporate world and moving further away from the struggles of their community. Of course, no matter how mad Dap gets at them, they are still boys and they only have one question for him. We want to know do revolutionaries eat Kentucky Fried Chicken? You know what? Revolutionaries probably don't for obvious reasons. Only in college do six Negroes pile into a car because only one of them has one. And why is every HBCU surrounded by a hood? Furthermore, why does the surrounding hood always have people who don't care for the students? These are all questions that the fellas are asking themselves when they run across some locals in KFC who immediately treat them like some uppity Negroes who think they are better than them. I think they must have had the fellas confused with the Gammas. The lead local in this movie, whose name actually is Leeds, is played by none other than Samuel L. Jackson. Hey, is that what the L stands for? They confront the fellas and tell them that just because they go to college doesn't mean they're anything other than Negroes. Dap, however, feels like how you carry yourself means more than any status symbol like whether you go to college or not. Real talk though, in some cities, some students do tend to act this way towards the locals, so in this situation, I would say that they're both right. The locals point kind of gets proven when Dap runs into Big Brother Almighty on the way home. He tells him that his cousin better cross over to Gamma or else, and Big Brother feels such threats are beneath him. Listen, if you fuck half pint, I fuck you. Oh, is that right? Well, let me tell you something. I am a Greek, and I don't play that. I am from Detroit, Motown. So you can watch Tootsie your monkey ass back to Africa if you want to. Dang, Detroit popping like that. He said that with such gusto. What homecoming weekend is complete without a step show? There is even evidence that another fraternity exists besides the Gamma since Alpha Phi Alpha is kicking things off. These are some actual real life alphas here who Spike got to do one of their routines. Better throw in that rock steady again for good measure. See Rachel, you don't need to join a sorority. There's at least 20 females right there. The Gammas come through like it's Phantom of the Opera and deliver an athletic as hell step routine. What is this, the Universal Circus? The behind the scenes info said it took them three days to learn this from some Q-Dogs, so apparently this kind of gymnastics was done in real life. I think I would have rather took the easy route like the fellas did here and just stomp in a circle while making fun of the Gammas. For the sissies, good job, yes! When I say Gamma, you say fag, Gamma, fag, Gamma, fag! When I say Gamma, you say fag, Gamma, fag, Gamma, fag! Yeah, some of that language sure wouldn't work today, boy. On the way out, one of the guys touched one of the Gamma Rays and according to everybody in the cast, a real fight started. And that's what you see in the film. No matter how many times I watch this, I have a hard time believing this is a real fight. It looks about as convincing as that hallway fight and lean on me, but hey, I'll let y'all keep that story alive. Dap decides to apologize for going in on Rachel the other day, but first he has to be verbally assaulted by a representative of every floor of the girls' dorm, as well as Miss Payne from House of Pain and oh snap, AJ Johnson was in school days, I'll be damned. This is actually both of their first movie roles. A lot of people got their start with this movie. Rachel forgives Dap after seeing all the torture he just got put through, and he apologizes for all the hardcore Greek hate he tries to push on her. I'm just gonna go on record right here and now and say that this is about what I would have been done if I was pledging. First of all, ain't no way I'm eating no dog food. I know my arm would have been about done after 15 minutes of holding this torch in the air. And won't you try to convince me that I'm squeezing poop in the toilet even if it really is bananas? Well, that's just about the line right there. Hey, call me what you want. I just don't think it's worth it. Obviously, these guys do because they put up with all that as well as the gammas getting all in their face and essentially torturing these dudes into quitting. I give them props though. They survive and celebrate becoming true gammas. I hope it was worth it. Now see, while all this was going on, this is where I would have been. Forget a pajama jammy jam. This is a straight up half naked pool party jam. I don't know if I could have been wearing what is essentially draws with all that ass shaking in my face though. There's a lot of willpower in that building, I tell you that. We get another musical performance by EU performing the butt song, and if it looks like it's super hot in that gym, that's because it really was according to the cast. They spent around 7 hours in that gym while trying to film this scene, and I bet after that long, being half naked was the last thing they were thinking about. Even though the pledges have crossed, Big Brother Almighty did say that he ain't pledging no virgins, and he means just that. And since Jane here would do anything for Big Brother, 
He sets it up for her to finally make half pint into a whole pint. Or is it just a whole? I don't know, I suck at math. She clearly doesn't want to go through with it. And it's a testament to just how much Jane Toussaint will put up with to maintain her status as the number one gamma ray. Too bad it was all just deployed by Big Brother Almighty to get rid of her, and he drops the caper on her at the worst possible time. This scene is kind of hard to watch, honestly, and Tisha Campbell really lays on the tears heavy and makes you believe her character just lost everything in this one man. She probably feels like Big Brother Almighty has been planning this all day, but no, sister, he's been planning it all week. Like a virgin. Touch for the very first time. Half Pint just has to tell somebody, so he runs to his cousin's dorm and wakes everybody up in the process. Dap is pretty impressed that he not only crossed, but also got him some cut up while he was at it. That is until Dap asks who the lucky lady is, and then quickly realizes that his cousin is truly no better than any other gamma dog. Calling your mother, it takes the real man to be a gamma because only yeah, gamma is the real, real man. Fucking asshole to do what you did. Gamma. Talk about brainwashed. For whatever reason, this motivates Dap to run outside and wake up the entire campus. This is without a doubt the weakest part of the movie and comes out of nowhere. I get what Spike was trying to get across by telling black people to wake up and start worrying about the useless things that divide us, but for whatever reason it just falls flat in this ending. Dang, Big Brother Almighty didn't waste no time finding another woman. Dang, Gamma Rays ain't shit. This ending is made even more weird by how close Giancarlo Esposito and Lawrence Fishburne get to each other. What's gonna happen? Are they finally gonna fight? Or are they gonna kiss? Maybe this actually was a love story after all and we just missed the point. Nah, they just both look at the camera and completely break character to tell us to wake up as we fade to black. School Days is without a doubt one of my favorite movies ever and like I said earlier, it's one of the reasons I was excited to attend an HBCU. Majority of the cast these days are movie and TV show royalty, and for this to be many of their first films, I feel like they turned in great performances. You would think the random inclusion of musical numbers would completely throw off the tone of the film, but for some reason, it just works and doesn't distract away from the story at all. The movie nails the HBCU experience down to a T. From the highs and lows of Greek life, to the band being the best part of the football games, and to the many different social groups that form. It's a testament to the accuracy of the movie even in 1988 that the majority of these issues it deals with you can still see discussed on social media platforms today. I don't know if that's a good thing or if it's sad. What I do know is, if you want an as close as it gets portrayal of HBCU college life, give or take a few technological differences, then it doesn't get any better than school days. My grade for school days is an A-. The movie is nearly perfect, but drops the ball on the ending, unfortunately. And that does it for this episode of The Black Track. Let me know how you felt about school days in the comments below. And if you liked the video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, I'll holla at you.